and use the chat to ask any questions that you have. So if you would like to learn more about our ladies or get involved, if you want to be a speaker, if you have ideas for topics or speakers, uh, once we're back in person, if you have ideas for sponsorship or locations, we would love to have them. Uh, you can contact us on Twitter, on Meetup, or through our Gmail account, which is listed there on the slide. Um, we love to get new ideas and new people involved. Tonight's speaker, as I mentioned, is Mine Chutankaya Rundell. She is a professor of practice and the director of undergraduate studies at the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, her, her work focuses on innovation in statistics and uh, teaching data science with emphasis on computing, reproducible research, um, student learning, and open source education. And she's also a data scientist and professional educator at our studio, uh, which is really, um, really great and impressive to have her here with us tonight. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Mine for uh, her presentation on our markdown. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here and lovely to be talking about our markdown, a tool I use just about every single day. So let me go ahead and um, share my screen, first of all. I think we are going to do it this way. Um, here we go. Okay, sorry, I have to like move my Zoom stuff around so I can see everything that I want to see while I'm talking. All right, wonderful. Um, yeah, so um, today um, I am talking about customizing our markdown. I'll do a little bit of a review of what our markdown is and then go into the various formats of our markdown that you can use. Um, the slides uh, can be accessed from the repo that's been linked in the chat, but also this short link at the bottom will get you to a rendered version of the slides as well. And um, I would created this presentation um, uh, originally for a Saturday's uh, workshop for Saturdays at Nairobi. So this is a um, uh, mountain from Kenya, <laughs> Kilimanjaro, um, that you can see here. And um, it's taken in Amboseli in Kenya. So we're going to kind of use coloring from this picture um, as we go through and uh, talk a little bit about theming and whatnot as well. But before we get there, let's get started uh, with what our markdown is. So whenever I think about um, our markdown, this is somewhat the thing that comes to mind, our in markdown sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Um, I remember a while back, um, there was a tweet, I think Alison Hill, who was working on our markdown at the time, um, had asked like, how would you describe our markdown in a short tweet? And this is what I came up with at the time. Um, so what do I mean by that? I think to understand what I mean by that, let's first talk about what is markdown. So markdown is a lightweight markup language. It has plain text formatting syntax, and it's designed so that it can be converted to HTML and any other formats. For many of you who might be coming into R from statistics, um, especially if you have done so through like an academic statistics training, chances are at some point you learned LaTeX. And you might be very good at LaTeX, you might love LaTeX, uh, or you might no, not enjoy it so much, maybe not as much as you enjoy our markdown. Um, but I think we could all agree, regardless of who you are, that LaTeX is a very syntax heavy uh, kind of language, right? There's a lot of backslashes, curly braces, whatnot. And it's actually quite difficult to read the raw um, source code of a LaTeX document. Um, it's easier to just um, compile it so that you can take a look at what the resulting document looks like. And it's usually a beautiful document. Markdown, on the other hand, I would, you know, you can make Markdown look quite beautiful, but by default, it looks quite plain. Um, but also the source code, which we're seeing on the left side of our screen right now, is very human readable as well. So instead of having lots of syntax and curly braces and whatnot to denote, say, the header, the subtitle, whatnot, we're able to get that to happen with very minimal syntax, in this case, just a few um, kind of hashtags to get us there. 
So that's the essence of Markdown. And then what do we, um, what is our Markdown then? It's basically R and Markdown together, meaning that you continue to hold on to this simple um, kind of authoring language Markdown, but you can sprinkle in it um, what we call chunks where your R code goes. So for example, over here on the left side of the document, you can see between lines, 15 and 20, we have these three little back ticks. And then in it, um, it starts with three little back ticks, ends with three little back ticks. And then in between those lines 16 through 19, we're seeing what we might recognize as our code. And we can also see that that band between line 15 and 20 is gray compared to the rest of the document being white. And that's basically what is defined as an R chunk or a chunk in general, in this case, an R chunk, because the language of the code that we wrote in that chunk is R. You can actually write other languages in an R markdown document as well. Despite the name R in it, in it you could change the en engineer running to say write Python code. So today I am going to focus on using R markdown to create documents where the code that we're writing is in R in these chunks. So we have text and then R code in chunks that gets converted to text, R code, but also the R output in HTML, but also in many other formats. So we'll take a look at some of the other formats as well. Um, the, um, I'm going to now show, so throughout this uh, presentation, I'm going to actually uh, take a break from the slides pretty regularly and then um, ask you to uh, kind of, well, I'll at least demo for you uh, what I'm talking about. So about six times or so, I'm gonna show you something on the slides and then we're gonna go and do something hands-on. Um, while I'm doing that, if you would like to follow along with the code, you have two options for doing so. One of them is that I set up an RStudio Cloud project for this. So if you would like, you could simply click on that first link on your slide, um, the first bit.ly link here. And I'll do that in a second and walk you through what you need to do that will ultimately lend you in an RStudio Cloud project. And you can kind of follow along with the documents I gave you. The second option is if you feel comfortable with GitHub and or if you don't feel like logging in or creating an account on another service, you can go to this um, GitHub repository that's set up for our, our Lady St. Louis and clone the repository. And then in that particular repository, there's a folder called exercises that contains the same six R Markdown documents that you can use to uh, do this locally on your computer. So I'm going to demo the RStudio Cloud option as I feel like that has like a an easier um, kind of starting point. But if you wanna do option two, you'll be looking at the exact same code. So if I was to click on this first link, um, that will open up and our Studio Cloud, um, our Studio Cloud um, window for me. So you should go ahead and log in here and I'm going to see if I can get to log on with a different account, here we go. Um, and once you log on, so I have a Google account. So I logged on with that. You can log in with Google GitHub, or GitHub, or if you are already something like RStudio Cloud, obviously user or shinyapps.io, uh, you can log in with those. If you don't wanna log in with these separate services, you can create an account there as well. Once you do and you log in, you'll land in something that looks like this. Um, so here, what we have is an RStudio session. Um, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to, first of all, uh, zoom in a little bit and I will ask um, maybe in the chat, somebody could let me know if the text is legible as is or if I should zoom in more. All right, great. Um, and so we have these uh, six R Markdown files that we're going to work with. But I want to draw your attention to something. Um, over here, we have the name of the uh, project that I've created for you. You will be able to see your name here. And next to it, you should see text that says temporary copy that's kind of linking. So what happened here is that I have created an RStudio Cloud project and shared it with you. Um, obviously, when I share an RStudio Cloud, Cloud project with others, I don't want them to make changes to my original project. So it actually makes a copy for you. So I would recommend if this is the format you are using, click on save a permanent copy so that you grab your own copy of this project. 
Um, and then you can come back to it whenever you want. Otherwise the work you do in here will not be saved. Um, so I'll give it about uh, just a few seconds for folks to catch up um, so that we can actually work through some of this together. And at the same time, I'm gonna pull up my notes over here. Yeah, if you have any questions, do pop them in the chat. Okay, so let me go back to my slides to begin with. So we have this RStudio Cloud project ready to go here. Um, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to introduce you to a very simple R Markdown document and walk you through some of the uh, kind of the structure of the R Markdown document. And if there are things that I don't highlight that you have questions about, don't hesitate to ask. My answer might be, we'll get to that in a second or answer it um, right at that time. And so let's go to our RStudio Cloud project and open the first R Markdown document called a one RMD simple. Um, and let's take a look at what we see here. Now, one of the things that I like to do whenever I open up an R Markdown document is before I even look in it, I just try to knit it. So let's go ahead and try to knit this R Markdown document. And when I knit the document, you can see that our studio actually opens a pop-up window for me. Or maybe in your case, you got an error when you tried to do this. And that's usually not, uh, especially if you're working in our studio cloud as in you're working in the browser, that is not an R error. It is instead uh, probably a browser error that says, hey, I don't like pop-up windows. Are you sure you want to see this pop-up window? Um, so if you wanna see kind of your R Markdown, the result of your R Markdown document in full color, uh, in full screen, this is the way to go. But generally when I'm working in R Markdown, I don't like that actually. So I'm gonna close this out. And one of the first things that I like to do is to click on this gear icon that's next to the knit button. And I am going to say that I would like to preview my document in viewer pane. And then I'm going to click on knit again. And now I can see my doc, the result of my, the output of my document on one side of my screen in the viewer pane. And I can see the source code on the other side of the screen in um, kind of the editor pane. And let's make this a bit smaller so that we can see the code and the output side by side. So what are some features of this document? First of all, um, on top of the document, we have some metadata about the document. Things like, what's the title of the document? What's the name of the author? And also, what format do we want our output to be? Do we want it to be HTML document or something else? Some of the something else is that you can get very easily. Uh, if we click on the um, little arrow next to the knit button, you can see you can knit to PDF. This requires that you have, if you're running things locally, that you have tech installed in your computer. Um, if you're working in our studio cloud, it should work out of the box for you. Or knit to Word, where the resulting document is a Word file. Again, if you're working locally, that means you need to have Word installed. Um, if you're working in our studio cloud, it will just work for you. I'm not gonna talk about the other options here for the time being, but you can see um, that if I was to change this to knit to PDF, um, my output options change. And I can also see the same output, for example, as a PDF, as well as a, um, an HTML file. So to keep things simple, I am going to go back to uh, saying that I just want an HTML document as a result. And leave it as such. Um, what we see here, this top area between these uh, three dash lines on top and the three dash lines on the bottom is called the YAML, which is where we have the metadata about our document. And when we knit it, you can see that those fields get special formatting. So our title is in large text, our author is in more of a subtitle text, for example. And then we have some text that is rendered just as text. Uh, we have um, these various um, hashtags uh, signify what level header we are at. So this is a second level header. So if you are an HTML user, uh, this is basically an H2 level header. And you can see that that is formatted in a particular way as well. Now let's get to talking about the R code a little bit. Um, 
over here in this R chunk, um, I, I am loading the packages that I'm going to use for my analysis in this R markdown document. This is generally good practice to declare the packages you're going to use at the very top of your document. If it's an R script, you would just have the R code. If it's an R markdown document, you would have a um, R chunk that loads those um, packages. One of three of these packages are on CRAN, so um, they have been pre-installed for you um, um, here um, just with install.packages. The last package, which is our Embacelli, where we're getting the colors of Embacelli from, um, is only available on GitHub, so they're uh, one of the ways that you can um, install it is using the DevTools package. Uh, so you would need to have the DevTools package installed first in order to be able to install that one. Um, all of these packages have been pre-installed for you in our Studio Cloud, so you don't have to worry about installing them um, if you're working here. But if you're working locally, you will need to install them. Now, this particular R chunk has no output. Right, we're just loading packages. So then what it looks like is that in an R markdown file, when we have an R chunk, it just looks like it gets a little bit of special formatting. It has a little box around it, but that's not all there is to R chunks. So let's scroll down a little bit more um, to the R chunk where we're actually doing a data visualization. So over here, I have loaded the data. I've done some data wrangling and finally, I am plotting the rainfall in Ambicelli uh, from the data that I have uh, loaded earlier in my document. So you can see that I start with a data, uh, data frame and then I do a little bit of uh, data wrangling and finally I plot it. And in my source code, all I have is this code that plots it. But in my output, I can actually see the result um, of my um, output. In fact, I have put some alternative text um, for, for example, uh, screen reader compatibility in my R chunk. And if I hover over my plot, I can see that um, I can see that um, uh, alternative text uh, being available to me as well. So basically, in a nutshell, what's happening in an R markdown document is you get your text back as text, you get your R code formatted in a particular way, uh, styled in a particular way, and then the result of that R code is also printed in your output as well. Now, a few features of an R Markdown document that I make heavy use of are the um, document outline. So when you have a document, especially if it's a long one, it's helpful to um, use kind of section headings and you can jump around it pretty easily um, in this manner uh, by kind of navigating around the um, outline. And the way you can bring that up is this little, um, uh, the um, icon that looks a little bit like a table of contents in a way. Another thing that's useful, um, despite being optional, is in terms of the construction of your R chunk. So let's go up to the very top uh, to our first R chunk and we can see that in constructing this R chunk, I start with these three backticks and then in curly braces, I say a few things. One of the things I say is the engine that I'm going to use to run my code, in this case, R. Um, you can see over here that I could use, uh, I could have um, chunks that use other languages as well. Um, the next thing is the, um, is the label for my chunk. So this is an optional entry. Uh, you don't have to label your chunks. And if you don't, by default, they're going to be labeled chunk one, chunk two, chunk three, so on and so forth. But the nice thing about labeling your chunks is one, it is one way of documenting your code. It's almost like adding some comments in your code in an R script. And number two, it is um, it really allows for navigation. So if you look in the bottom, uh, kind of the bottom of this uh, our script or the editor window, the editor pane, you can see that we have this little green C here that stands for chunks. And if I click on this little navigator, um, I can actually easily jump to other chunks in my um, document. And if I have given them reasonable names. Um, it becomes a lot easier 
to figure out, hmm, maybe I wanna change how I plot my data. So this is the chunk I'm going to go to versus I think that I made a mistake when I was loading my data. So this is the chunk that I was going to go to. So an R Markdown document will work without a label. And as I said, if I was to remove one of the labels, let's go ahead and do that. Um, you'll still get the chunk number, just not the label here. Um, but it is useful to have these um, labels um, because it allows you to uh, navigate things a lot more easily. Um, okay, so that's to start with, this is kind of um, what we have um, in terms of the structure of an R Markdown document. So I'm gonna stop here for a second and look in the chat to see, are there any questions about kind of the basics of working in an R Markdown document? Ah, very good. So what is message false? So let's go ahead and take that out and take a look. And then, um, so what these are what we call knitter options, knitter being the R package that serves as the kind of the underlying R package that allows R Markdown to um, take um, R code and run it in an R session and then kind of report the results. So when you're constructing an R chunk, in addition to a label, you can also add some options. So we had an option here called message equals false. I took that out. And I'm going to now knit my document to show you what happens when I take it out. And then we can talk about what some other options are. So when you load the tidyverse package, it's a bit chatty. It tells you what it's doing. It tells you that I'm loading these eight packages with their particular versions. These are the core tidyverse packages. It also tells you that I am overwriting two of the functions that were available to you in your session. Um, so this is a package startup message, and it is helpful for you to kind of see what you're doing, uh, but it does make your documents a little bit messy. Similarly, the janitor package, which I love using for data cleaning, especially cleaning names of variables, um, turns out a bit uh, chatty as well because it also is uh, kind of overwriting uh, some of the uh, functions that are available in the base R distribution. So it is giving you that message. Um, these messages are helpful to see in the first instance, but usually you don't want in your output. So then I say message false um, and let's go ahead and knit it. Um, and so that will hide the messages. Other um, things, other chunk options that can be helpful um, are there are a few more chunk options that can be helpful that I'll get to in one of the other steps. All right, so let's go back to our slides and talk about the visual editor a little bit. Um, this is not so much about customizing your R Markdown document, but it's another way of interacting with R Markdown. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk about it a little bit. So the visual editor looks something like this. It allows you uh, allows the visual editing of all text, tables, lists, et cetera, and a support for citations. And um, it um, allows you to do kind of cross references and footnotes and uh, equations and whatnot pretty easily. Um, it has real-time spe spell checking and outline navigation, just like our markdown documents do. Um, and also it has a tight integration with uh, source editing. So when you're writing in the visual format that you can see here on the right hand side, actually under the hood, that document is being written in plain text. So you can always go back to seeing what's happening in plain text. And that's really, really important if you're going to be version controlling your files. Um, and you can basically um, install, insert anything um, with the um, catch all uh, kind of um, Apple slash shortcut here. So let's go ahead and take a look at how the visual editor works. So I am going to go back to our Studio Cloud. I'm going to close the document that we were working with, and I'm going to go to my files pane and uh, open document number two, which says O2 visual editor. Again, as soon as I get a document, I like to knit it first before I do anything to it, because that tells me when I took over this document, it was working. 
So then if I make any edits and then things don't knit, I know that I made a mistake versus if you start uh, editing a document right away uh, that a collaborator may have shared with you and then try to knit it, now you're left with the mystery of, did they pass down something broken or did I mess it up? Um, so I've knit the document, I know it's working. And what I'm going to do is in my, um, in my um, uh, kind of this editor um, pane, I am going to click on this little compass icon, which if I hover over it, it says switch to visual markdown editor. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, if you are working um, in our studio locally, uh, note that you need our studio 1.4 or higher in order to have this functionality. So if you're not seeing the compass icon, you're probably working with an older version of our studio. So when I try to switch to visual mode, um, it tells me a few things. It says this mode enables you to compose markdown using a familiar word processor style interface. I kind of think about the visual editor as being able to insert our chunks into like a Google doc or something like that. And it says that we can switch between uh, visual and source mode at any time. And if you click on this little link here, it will open it up for you in a new window where you can get to the documentation for the visual editor. And so I find this web page to be really, really helpful as I'm learning to use the visual editor because there's a lot of new things in there for me. Um, so I navigate to it pretty regularly. But let's get out of the help and say, okay, let's use visual mode. So now we can see that I have the same exact document. I have my outline available to me as well that I can show or hide, but my editor looks a little bit different. My text is almost indistinguishable from the output here versus in the source code version, it was very clear what was source code versus what was output. Um, so my, in fact, uh, something that I like to do when I'm working in the visual editor sometimes is to say, I don't need this site anymore. I can like literally write my arm mark down by simply using my editor. Cause when I type things, they look like they've already been rendered. Um, I also have my R chunks. And just like before I can knit to run my R chunks or I can click on any of the, um, click on the little green uh, arrow on any of my chunks in order to uh, kind of run just one of the chunks as well. So um, in a way, there isn't a whole lot that's different here in terms of how um, our chunks are, how our chunks look versus um, kind of your general text looks, but let's show a few things. So what I can do is say, if I want to bold things, I no longer need to remember to the markdown um, kind of formatting for it. I can simply say, make it bold for me and make it also maybe italic and um, underlined as well, or get rid of those. And the shortcuts you might be used to from uh, your um, kind of uh, usage of like maybe command B and whatnot also work here for this as well. Now, what if I wanted to insert another section? So I could say, go to the insert, and you know, decide that I want to maybe insert a, what should we do? Something like inline math. And then maybe I can actually write the inline math here and it will convert it for me to the inline math as I write that. When I click on it to go edit, I go back to um, source code again. But also if when I want to insert things, another thing I can do is if I just uh, type the, uh, press the um, forward slash, it brings this kind of um, um, menu for me where I can basically pick whatever it is that I want to insert. If you wanted to insert a table, you can decide this is the table you wanna insert. And all of a sudden making um, tables in Markdown is a lot easier than when you had to remember to write the source code. So let's go ahead and delete this as well. Uh, to delete the table, I think I'm going to right click and click on delete table. Um, another thing that I really like the uh, visual editor for is, um, is um, adding citations. So let's say that I want to add a citation for the tidyverse. Let's go ahead and click on the sorry, command forward slash 
and say, I want to insert a citation. So you can actually link this up to something like, um, if you have used Zenodo, for example, you could link that up as well. I haven't set up a Zenodo um, uh, library to go along with this um, RStudio Cloud project, but if you locally use it, you might. But one of the really nice things is that you can actually grab it from a DOI as well. So let's go ahead and grab the DOI for the Tidyverse paper. So this is actually doing a live search for the DOI. I haven't you know, programmed this before. It's finding it. It allows me to do either in-text citation, which is kind of where you would say, you know, Chetinka Arundel 2012 says, or something like that, versus uh, putting it in parentheses. So I'm going to not use in-text citation. You can decide what you want to call your reference file to be. So I'm going to call it references.bib, which is the default. And I say, fine, just insert it for me. So what we can see here is that it added a line to my YAML by default. It added the citation for me as well. And if I go ahead and knit my documents, I should be able to see the citation here. And if I scroll to the very bottom, I can actually see that the citation, um, the reference shows up. So in order to do the, do the um, adding the citation, I wanted to get that kind of catch all insert menu. So you can do that with either command forward slash or just forward slash, depending on where you're at in the document. So if you just try um, kind of oops, forward slash and it just types the forward slash for you and doesn't do anything, try a command forward slash. Okay, um, another thing that, as I said, um, that's I think really nice in terms of this um, editor is uh, doing tables. So my workflow at least for doing tables when writing in uh, kind of the source editor used to be, go to the help menu, uh, look for markdown quick reference, and then scroll here to try to remind myself um, how to make tables. I would generally copy this, paste it into my source code, and then um, and then I would start editing it. Um, and I needed to, if I needed to do something a little bit fancier with tables, I would probably um, need to like Google my way around it. Now I can, it's a bit easier um, to enter, uh, insert tables here. So let's take a look at um, something we might insert a table for. So for this uh, mock data analysis, I grabbed data from the um, kind of Amboseli um, rainforest. And um, I said that we are going to do a recoding of one of the data, uh, one of the variables. So if month is June through October, we're calling it the dry season. Remember that's in the Southern hemisphere. And otherwise we're calling it the wet season um, for the season variable. So maybe something I might want to do is a table that explains how I do the recoding as opposed to doing it in my narrative here. So in order to do that, I'm going to insert a new line here and forward slash, start looking for a table. And I want a table with say three rows and two columns. I can add a caption, um, something like mapping months to seasons. And now I might say something like, this is going to be the um, month and this is going to be the season. And if the month is June through October, We are going to call it wet season. And if it's November through May, we're going to call it dry season. And this was an unnecessary row I had. So I'm going to right click and say, I want to delete this row. And let's go ahead and knit our documents. So now I have a nice table in my document with um, caption as well. And I could do some styling in terms of how I want this table to be shown, but this becomes quite more simple to um, 
you know, insert these sorts of things into uh, your document when you're using the visual editor. So any questions about using the visual editor? All right, so then let's move onwards. Um, let's talk a little bit about customizing chunk options. So we talked about this message false. Um, you might also add warning false as a chunk option uh, to suppress messages and also warnings if you want, but do so with caution. Um, it's an option I use pretty regularly when I'm using ggplot2 because ggplot2 tends to be pretty chatty and tell me things like, oh, you had some NAs in your data that I didn't uh, plot, which I very much appreciate that it tells me that, but I don't necessarily need that in my final report if I'm okay with the NAs being emitted. So that's a place where I would uh, set warning equals to false. Um, you can do error equals true, which will allow your document to knit, even if there is an error. Um, that might be a particularly useful option if you teach with our markdown and actually part of what you're trying to do is to teach um, what could give an error. And also include equals false to run, but hide the output messages, warnings, et cetera. So let's go ahead and, um, oh, let's talk about a few more options. Um, if you are um, setting your chunk options for figures is generally a good idea. So here are the uh, recommended chunk options for figures. I generally up the retina level. Um, I generally set a width for my figures. If I'm writing a document or creating slides, that's generally 70% for me by default, I might increase it, but that basically says 70% of the width of your text should be your figure. And then I like setting a fig width. So this is actually in inches um, for my figure. And then I also set an aspect ratio for my figure. Um, and so I don't, manually also define the figure height, but instead use an aspect ratio that is known to be visually pleasing. So that's the golden ratio there um, for my aspect ratio and play around with that as needed, as opposed to playing with the width and the height together and potentially getting a distorted image. Um, I also strongly recommend that you add alt text to your figures for uh, screen readers um, as well, which you can now do with fig.alt uh, chunk option. If you're interested in more about how do I get my figures to look nice in an R Markdown document, there are two resources that I would recommend in the R for Data Science book by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolleman. There is a chapter on graphics for communication, which I think is a very good chapter, just like the rest of the book, but also has some tips about including uh, figures in our markdown. And then the other uh, recommendation I have is a blog post by Zev Ross. It's a few years old now, but a lot of what's there still holds true. Um, and it's a quite lengthy blog post, as you can see, and lots and lots of important details about making sure your figures really shine in your R Markdown document. Because if you are a long time R user and long time R Markdown user, you may have also found yourself in a situation where you work really hard for getting a figure right and then finally knit your document and realize, why well, doesn't that look good here? So some of these can be helpful. Um, so one other thing that you can do is you can set options at the global level. So instead of doing so chunk by chunk where we've seen next to the chunk label, I can set global options for the whole document. So particularly for figures, this is what I like to do at the top of my document. Um, I use this opt chunk function from uh, Knitter and it has some options you can say get or set here. So we're going to set it. And then this means for all of the chunks going forward, use these particular um, um, options for, in this case, creating the figures. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these chunk options. Um, so I am going to close out of this. And then let's open the chunk options document. Let's turn the visual editor again, why not? And close the outline. And so now we can see um, that we have um, kind of these um, various um, chunks. We had said that we can do add um, options one at a time. 
with something like this, but something else you might want to do is add a global chunk. So I am going to do insert R code chunk. And in here, uh, we can um, basically say, so it was opt chunk set, and we're going to set a few things. So we're going to up the retina level, we said. Uh, we are going to set a width for all of our figures, 70%. We are going to um, set a fig width. Um, six inches, and we're going to set a fig asp or aspect ratio 0.618. So let's go ahead and knit this document. I'm trying to use a shortcut that doesn't exist. And we can basically see uh, when we knit the document, those um, options, the chunk options that we had set basically affected our figure here. That is in fact uh, about 70% of the width of the text and it uses a particular aspect ratio that we identified. Now, the thing is this, op this uh, um, chunk is actually visible, which is probably something we don't want to see. So what we might instead do is say, I want you to run this chunk, but I don't want you to show it to me. I don't want to, I don't want you to show me any result from it. And I don't want to see the chunk itself, the code itself in my results. So I might use something like include false here. And I might also say, um, give it, a, um, or maybe, maybe a better label would be something like global options or something like that. And let's go ahead and knit that. And so now we should see that that chunk is not shown, but it is still affecting the rest of our document. Now, another thing that you might do is say you're developing your code, your analysis in an R markdown document, and then you're done, right? And you want to pass off the results as an HTML document or as a PDF to somebody who is interested in your analysis but doesn't want to see your code. You want to keep things reproducible, so you don't want to just copy and paste things out of here. So you can set in your global chunk option an option to say turn off all of the code. So basically, we're saying echo equals false for all of the code. We want to see any result of it, but we don't want to see the code itself. So now our resulting document looks something like this, a lot shorter because we don't have the code in it anymore. But actually, it is still fully reproducible because the source code contains the code itself. So uh, one of the questions in the chat is, what does fig asp do? So let's go ahead and make it uh, um, you know, a different number and knit the document kind of to get a sense of what it does. So in this case, I said two for the figure asp. So that means the height of my figure is two times the width of my figure. So it tells you the ratio of your height to the width of your figure. And I like going with 0.618 because that generally results in a visually pleasing um, kind of um, ratio for the height and the width. All right, so any questions about chunk options? Then let's go back to our slides and talk a little bit about customizing our output. So um, we can customize our output with a simple change in the YAML. I already showed you how to generate a PDF, for example, and how you can get a Word document. But there are other outputs that you can use that come from other packages as well. So for example, there's a particular style called the Tufti style for um, kind of um, authoring where you have a little bit of a sidebar, basically, um, which is where you um, where you can kind of include figures in the sidebar as opposed to kind of in your document. Um, so you can get that, but that lives in a different package called Tufty. So you can actually get outputs that are implemented in other packages as well. Um, so let's go ahead and give a few of these a try. So I am going to go back to our Studio Cloud. I'm going to close this third document, open my fourth document instead. Um, let's turn on the visual editor for it. 
turn off our outline, knit our document to make sure it behaves how we want it to behave before we get into editing things. And let's change a few things. So one of the things that I like to do is uh, actually define some options for my um, HTML document output. So I have moved that HTML document to the next line and I am going to add a table of contents. That's what the TOC stands for, say true. And I will also say that I want that to be a floating table of contents. I'll call that true as well. And let's go ahead and knit this document. Um, so maybe let's pop this out to a new uh, screen so you can see that we now have a table of contents for our document that is floating as in it doesn't move with the rest of the document on one side. Um, and we were able to achieve that simply by adding these options that are available for us for HTML document. And there are a bunch of other options that are available as well, but this is one that I heavily use. Um, another one that you might, um, uh, the, another one I mentioned was what if we were to get an output that um, comes from a different package? So let's go ahead and use the um, Tufty output. So that comes from the package Tufty. That's where after that we have the colon colons and then Tufty HTML. Although as soon as I do this, it's going to tell me, hey, you haven't installed the Tufty package. So let's go ahead and install that as well. I wonder if it installed it. Sometimes it gets a little bit stuck. Um, so just clicking um, enter in the console um, starts the package installation. So now that package is installed, so we can go ahead and knit our document to see the results. So you can see that that output looks a lot more different now, um, a lot different styling. Um, it actually does look like, um, you know, it's from um, Book of Edward Tufty. And um, something that you might then do is um, for that uh, R chunk where we were defining our um, figure, I might add a new argument to it called fig.margin equals true, saying that I want you to place this figure in the margin. So let's go ahead and knit it one more time and pop this out to full uh, screen so that you can see that the figure has now been moved to the side. That fig margin um, option only lives in this um, package, top T, because it's a very kind of, um, Mm, signature stylistic choice, I suppose, that Edward Tufty uses. Um, so there are other, many, many other um, implemented outputs. One of my favorite ones comes from the articles package, that's articles, uh, because it has um, output options defined for various journals. Uh, so if you're submitting an article to one of those journals, you can basically get the style file for it for free. So let's take a look to see if there are other questions in the chat. It looks like Janine answered the last question. So uh, we'll leave that there. And um, maybe let's take a few minute break before we get to the last two um, uh, activities. Does that sound good? I think we were saying we may wanna take a few minute break right at this time. Okay, great. So we're at 57 past. Shall we say we'll come back at two past? So that's a five minute break. Is that good? Sounds good to me. Okay. All right.
Okay, well, welcome back. So we have a couple more examples to go through and then I'm happy to answer any sort of general questions as well. Our next example is on customizing your theme. Um, so one of the things that you can do is changing your theme by changing output options. So by default, you're able to change how syntax highlighting works in um, uh, your R chunks. You can apply a particular one of the themes that's built in, or if you have written some CSS. So if you know a little bit about um, web design and writing CSS, you can write a custom CSS file and ask our markdown to apply it at the time of knitting as well. And you can get to this by uh, from the kind of the R markdown document options. Um, other ways for doing this uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility in your uh, theming are two new-ish packages. Uh, one of them is called BS Lib. Uh, it is tools for customizing, customizing bootstrap, bootstrap themes directly from R, uh, making it much easier to customize the appearance of both Shiny apps and our Markdown documents. And so if we click on this link here for bootstrap themes, you can you might recognize some of these look, looks, um, even if you haven't uh, kind of uh, used them before. Oh, we don't have really options. I'll show you a few of the um, things in a second. Or you can use thematic um, for kind of simplified theming of ggplot2, lattice and base R graphics automatically styled in our markdown documents as well as in Shiny Apps and the RStudio IDE as well. So let's go ahead and give this a try in our documents. So I am going to go back to RStudio Cloud and I'm going to close my document. I'm going to go back to the um, um our studio um cloud uh the files pane and open up the fifth document that says 05 theme and i will turn on my visual editor and there was a question about this in the chat and i wonder um so i think we may have gotten to the bottom of it but you do need uh our studio version 1.4 or higher to get to the visual editor. Actually, what I'm showing right now has nothing to do with the visual editor. So we don't really need to use it and we can revert back to the source editor as well. But in general, one way to tell is if you're seeing these hashtags, you're in the source editor. And so this uh, insert menu will not work here. That's only something that works in the um, uh, visual editor. Let's close our document outline to give us a little bit of room. And let's go ahead and use uh, some, um, do some theming. Um, so one of the things I had said is we can uh, click on this little gear icon and pick our output options and we can change how syntax highlighting is done. Let's click on Espresso. We can apply a different theme. Let's say Yeti and I'll just hit okay. And let's knit this document to see what we get. So our document looks quite more different again. It has, it uses a different font, a different background. And because of the highlighting style espresso, I'm getting this kind of like dark theme for my code. So this is one way of changing things. But as you saw, if you choose this way, your options are limited to whatever built-in options you have. Um, something else you can do, using the uh, thematic um, kind of elements is that under HTML document, we could actually define a new theme. So I am going to say I'm defining a new theme. I'm going to pick a color for background and a color for back foreground and a primary color. And so these are hex code hex codes that work nicely with that image from Ambicelli that I was using. But you know, you can do some recognized colors like red or something like that as well. But let's go with the hex codes here and let's go ahead and knit our document to see what we get. So now the look of my document has changed um, quite a bit. Uh, the background is this blue color um, that I grabbed from the um, from the um, image, and then the foreground is the or the primary color that we're writing with is this kind of beige-ish color. But you can see that my figure really stands out like a sore thumb here. I have this nice blue background, and then my figure is all white. Um, so what I might want to do is actually integrate the color scheme of my figure with 
my um, with basically my um, the rest of my document. So let's go back here. And what we might do is we might add a setup chunk. So I will do this here. Maybe I will call this setup. And here I will use the thematic package and particularly use the thematic RMD function uh, from it. Um, and let's also add a chunk option to say, don't show me this code um, where I'm setting up my theme. And let's go ahead and knit our document. So now you can see that actually the background of the ggplot2 has matched the rest of my, um, uh, my document as well. So this is a really easy way for auto theming, although you can now see those white um, kind of maybe the grid lines might look a bit too jarring. Maybe these years are really difficult to read. So now you might go back and edit your uh, plot a little bit more, but the amount of work you're going to need to do to match the colors is a lot less than if you were starting from scratch. Um, so are there any questions about theming? All right, then maybe let's go ahead and open up our last, or go back to our last example. So let's go back to the slides and talk a little bit about, oh, a question, does the ESLib and thematic work with Bookdown? Yes, they should work with Bookdown. I actually don't know off the top of my head if they do, but I, I think that they should work with Bookdown, yeah. Um, so when it comes to customizing our format, um, we might do different things. So a question about book down came up. That's how you can write books that are basically our markdown base. If you're building a website, you might use blog down or distill or package down. If you're creating a slide deck, like the one we're looking at right now, you might use sure engine. If you're creating a dashboard, you might use flex dashboard. So there are many, many more um, our markdown options. And the kind of the nice thing about each of these is you start with basically the same ish source um, and get different formats just depending on what you declare in your YAML. I'm saying same ish because you'll see in a second how we're going to go from this single document to a slide deck. And I will need to edit the source code just a little bit, but the edits are going to be, you know, very minimal actually. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and give you guys a poll. So you should be able to, if you're following along, see this poll here. Um, so my question for you is, have you ever made slides from our markdown before? So go ahead and give your answer. My answer is yes, so I'm going to go and send it. And in the meantime, I will let you all answer the question. I think so far, um, a few people did. Um, in the slide, so you should be able to see the poll in the slide. If you're now following along with the slides, let me go ahead and copy and paste it. You don't need to be in the cloud version in terms of uh, looking at it. So if you're just viewing the slides yourself, uh, you should be able to see. And you can see as people are giving answers, we were able to see kind of the answers live and we didn't have to leave our, our um, slide deck at all. So I'll show you in a second how to embed one of these into your slide deck too. So the answers are nice. A lot of us have not, it looks like, but many of us have. But also I wanted to show this as a functionality. And in fact, I forgot to start a timer, but we could have started a timer for folks to um, answer the question as well. So. Let's move on and create one of these slide decks and actually insert one of these um, uh, kind of um, uh, polls into it as well. So I'm going to go back to RStudio Cloud for the last example um, to my files. Let's open up 06 Sharingen, which is the name of the package that we're using to make slides. And the first thing that I am going to do is I am going to uh, change the output 
to a Sharingan moon reader. And then let me add a few more options to this to begin with. And I will actually put these in the chat for you too. So um, my output looks something like this for anyone who wants to follow along and do pay attention to indentation. And another thing that I am going to do, or you can actually see already done here, is in between my uh, sections, I have these three dashes, and these basically define where my slides uh, begin and end. So let's go ahead and knit this document and see what we get. So now, as you can see, I have a slide deck from the same content. Um, each of those sections live in their own slides or uh, on an individual slide. Uh, the one thing I can't really see is this data visualization because it didn't fit in this slide, but we'll get to that in a second. But this is how easy it was to go from the document to the slides version simply by adding these three dashes to indicate where my slides should end and then changing the output format. Um, what are some other things that we might like to do? Um, so something that I will do is um, add a setup chunk here. And I'll say, I don't want to include uh, the result, the, whatever happens in this chunk. And I am going to, um, Let's see, bring in some chunk options um, that might be um, helpful for our slides, mainly about um, figure sizing. So these are basically chunk options that we had seen before, except I've, I've made things a little bit bigger, my figures, and I've also increased my dots per inch. Generally, if you have slides, you're going to be projecting them on a, a screen maybe, so it makes sense to increase your DPI as well. So this is basically what I'm going to have for my setup chunk. Let me just put that in the chat as well for anyone who is interested in copying and pasting it. And let's go ahead and knit this document. Although as of now, we won't really be able to see the result of um, what we added to our setup chunk, because remember my figure doesn't even show up yet, okay? Um, so some things that I could do is I could turn off my code. Remember we talked about eco equals false as a chunk option and I could knit my document. And if I do that, then all of the code is going to be hidden from my slides, which depending on your audience might be preferable or not. Uh, but now you can see your data visualization a little bit better. So it's whenever I have this sort of situation where I, my figure doesn't quite fit is when I start moving, playing around with things. And usually the first thing I play around with is my out width. So that doesn't change the aspect ratio or anything. I'm going to make that 70% of my uh, screen as opposed to 90%. And let's go ahead and knit it. And so now my figure looks a lot better, okay? Um, what are some other things that I might want to do? So I have pre-included for you uh, this color palette. Um, that comes from the R Ambaselli package, okay? Um, it actually comes basically with a color palette and I am extracting those colors because I want to use them. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use a package called uh, Sharingan Femur. Um, so let's create an R chunk. So someone asked about a shortcut for R chunk. Um, so you can do that from here, or there is a keyboard shortcut as well that I never use and hence never remember. So it looks like I hadn't pre-installed the Share Engine Themer package. So if you're on the cloud, you're going to need to, um, it's going to prompt you to install it. Uh, 
And there's another question about keeping the code and showing the plot in a separate slide. So I will show that in a second. So I think we were able to install the share engine theme or package, which basically allows you to define some CSS in a way, but do it in your R markdown in your document as an um, R like within an R function to do your styling. And this one, I am totally going to cheat off of code that I have created ahead of time, uh, just because this would be quite a lot to kind of try to figure out. Um, maybe let's get rid of the image because I realized that I did not bring that in. Um, okay. So I am going to share this code with you all, if you are interested. And let's go ahead and say theming and then include false for this code chunk. And let's go ahead and knit things. Oh, so I knitted it. However, my style didn't change. And it's because currently this R Markdown document does not know to include, uh, to use this style. But if I go to my files pane, you can see that a new file was created. A CSS file was created for me. And it says this file was generated by Sharing and Themer. You know, don't overwrite it. Um, in fact, instead change um, your code here. So what we need to tell our, our markdown document is that we actually wanted to recognize that CSS file. So I can go up to my, RAM, my YAML and say, please use that CSS file. And let's go ahead and knit this document. Okay, this is the great thing about um, the great thing about these demos, isn't it? I have like totally tested this out. Now it's giving me a little bit of an issue. Sharingen dash themer dot CSS. And then again as though that would do something. Okay. <laughs> uh, so much for that. Let's try deleting these outputs and let's try to debug this on the fly to see what the issue might be. I'm trying to remember to see if there are any um, other setting that I am forgetting. No, it's definitely not recognizing it. I don't think this needs to be a text string, but just in case, try that. Um, <laughs> I'm really not sure what the issue is. Now it worked for me in a completely different way. Okay, maybe I will figure out what the issue is with the theming and show you guys something uh, slightly different than the theming. I can't seem to figure it out on the fly. Um, let's see. Ah, I think you're right, Priscilla. I think it needs to be here. I think you might be absolutely right. Let's give it a try. There we go. Indeed, <laughs> that, that, that's what it was. I was putting the CSS definition on the wrong line. So now my um, kind of Sure Engine file 
the theming of my share engine file looks a lot more different. And what I have done is I've grabbed those colors uh, that were defined in that Ambaselli palette and use them in this style duo accent function, which basically creates an accent um, kind of file uh, that some sort of um, kind of accented CSS file for me. Um, so let's maybe not have any sort of kind of styling for the title and we'll knit this again. And I will show one last thing after this that was about basically the, um, the code. So this is basically what my file looks like. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so the next thing was about this, um, uh, this particular data visualization and trying to show the code and the figure together. So another package that you can use is Sharingen Extra. Let's, um, oh, come on. So we're going to load one more package called Sharingen Extra, and we're also going to enable some of its functionality, uh, primarily this uh, panel set functionality. So I will say include equals false for this as well. So that package I have previously installed for you. And what we can do is let's go ahead and turn our code back on. So I'm going to get rid of this equal false. And when we get up down to our figure, so that last R chunk, I am going to put this in a panel set. So I'm defining a new kind of div in my document. That's a panel set. And I am also going to define a chunk option that basically says panel set where I have um, my output. I want it to be in a panel that's called plot and my source, I want it to be in a panel that's called code. Um, and let's go ahead and knit this. Oh, really? Okay, I haven't pre-installed this for you either. So let's go ahead and figure out, I think this package, um, is it on CRAN? Let's see if it's on CRAN and see if we can uh, install it from there. At some point it wasn't. Yeah, we haven't done anything. So it, while it's installing, uh, one of the questions is when we want to insert some data analysis, how do you import those results to the presentation in Sure Engine? Um, I think that the way I generally think about doing data analysis is not importing results, but actually doing it in the R Markdown document and then using those chunk options to either hide or show the code so that we can um, so that we can kind of hide from the presentation whatever doesn't need to be there and only show the results. So instead of moving things into a presentation, I generally actually think about like creating things there. However, obviously, if your analysis is a lot bigger than your presentation, you may, um, you're just going to, I don't really have a great way other than kind of copying and pasting our markdown code into my sure engine file. Yeah, so we do need to install it from um, GitHub. I guess I, I did remember that correctly. But here we go. So let's go ahead and try installing this. Come on, RCD Cloud, you can do it, you can do it. I don't know why it, like at this installation step, it's often um, a little bit slow. So let's go ahead and try knitting this document. So remember, we enabled the use of panel sets. And then in our code chunk, we said we do want to use a panel set. 
So if we scroll to our last slide, you can see that we can see our code and our plot on the same slide. Um, it's still a little bit, uh, maybe the text is taking up too much space. So I could do something like just put this thing in a separate slide to give it like a little bit more breathing room. Um, and then maybe one last thing I could, um, well, the other, the other last thing that I was going to show you was how to um, kind of embed one of these, um, um, what do you call it? polling things. So in order to be able to do that, you would need to, I usually use Slido for polling, you can use it for free. And that's generally the reason why I do. Um, but if you go to uh, Slido, you can create a poll. So I am going to quickly log in and show you the poll that I created for this. Um, and then once you create your poll, uh, you can go to settings and say that I want to look at the integrations and there is something called embed Slido. If you simply copy your embed code and put that in your um, presentation, so I haven't done anything other than embedding that, I can then knit my document. It has a particular ID for my uh, Slido um, that I had created and it won't be visible in the RStudio um, viewer. But over here, if I pop it into a new slide, I should be able to see that actually it's been embedded and the results of the poll are here as well. Um, one question is how do we make all the figures center? So you can use fig.align, oops equals center. And if you want all of them centered, you would put that in your setup chunk. So um, I went through a lot of stuff and apologies for some of the hiccups towards the end there. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, the our Markdown gallery is a great place to go through because it's I find it kind of inspirational to look at other people's our Markdown documents. Uh, we have a new cheat sheet uh, for our markdown that's been updated over the summer. Um, that's, I think, immensely useful as well. And it gives you some tips about using the visual editor too. Um, and I wanna thank the RStudio R Markdown team and all the R Markdown community for all the fantastic things they uh, create. And the RStudio Cheat Sheets intern, Avery Perney, with whom I worked on the cheat sheet uh, and made me refresh all of my R Markdown knowledge while we did that. And also Fernando Campos for that R Micelli package um, that I grabbed the colors from. So thank you very much. The slides will continue to remain here and also the, um, the GitHub um, um, repository as well. And the RStudio Cloud project is there too, if you want to go back and play around with it. So thanks a lot. And I'm happy to answer a couple of questions, even though I know we're coming up on time. I'll stop sharing my slides. Well, thank you so much. Sounds like everyone enjoyed it. Getting a lot of thank yous, but no questions yet in the chat. Yeah, that's fine by me. <laughs> oh, it's so, it's so much knowledge. I'm going to have to watch the video like three times. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. All right. Well, well thank um, you so much for having me. Sure, thanks for coming and teaching us all about our markdown. We really appreciate your time and effort. Uh, and um, yeah, everybody join me in clapping or thanking or whatever you feel like you can do in Zoom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> thanks. It's a standing ovation. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good rest of your evening. You too. Bye.